Imagine that your heroes are traveling through a mysterious and complicated interior complex searching for something or someone as their encounter. And imagine that as they approach, your lead hero, this guy right here, sees coming out of the shadows, this guy right here, a cat and a mouse. This is, in a sense, the core of what social combat is. The cat and mouse game, which of course is a predecessor to a prelude to combat, to consumption, to death. But the taunting, the back and forth, the, um, the possibility of interaction, non-lethal interaction, perhaps interaction that ends with the retreat of somebody, that is social combat. And social combat in RPGs, especially I think when doing solo, is something that can add a lot of flavor and can get you away from the endless question-answer yes-no loop that I think sometimes, at least I experience, when I am running some sort of adventure for myself. And by that I mean you get to a place where you want something to happen and you kind of keep asking questions to get something to happen and nothing really happens because you are, in essence, trying to get out of a final encounter of combat and you might not want combat. Another way to think of, and by combat I mean combat in the traditional sense, another way to think of social combat is to think of what happens in a book like this. This is uh, perhaps the quintessential model of social combat. Jane Austen, not just this novel, but all her works are people wielding social power to get what they want. And um, another great author with this is the um, amazing George Eliot, who also in a later time period and in a different way, really perfected the art of social combat, particularly women using the power that they had um, and extending that social power to get things in political and even economic and certainly social realms. So I want to just talk a little bit about social combat in solo RPGs coming from what I think is a totally unlikely and almost odd source. I found in my journey through the RPG world this, the Dallas television role-playing game by, of all people, Jim Dunnigan, uh, Redmond Simonson, Graphics and Physical Systems Design. Here are the other credits for it. This was an SPI publication from 1980, and um, it is obviously based on the trademarked Dallas television show, which some, some of you may be familiar with. I'm not going to go through the role-playing game itself, but uh, beyond just saying that it is meant to model certain shows, basically certain episodes. I didn't really watch it enough to know whether this is actually modeling episodes that occurred or it is um, just using the general sense of an episode. They, the GM is called the director here, and the characters are the characters from the show. And there are some actual script suggestions for episodes and things of that nature. I'm not going to be talking about any of that. What I am going to be talking about and demonstrating is the social combat system that is the mainstay of this game and showing how you can graft elements of it onto other systems. I think for the first example, or the example I'm using here, I'm going to be taking some D&D characters and just showing how you can take the social combat rules here and apply them to situations you might be running in other games. We're going to focus on three aspects of social conflict. Persuasion, coercion, and investigation. The central idea behind these concepts is that the use of any one of these attributes is done to attempt to have the target of the attempt turn over information or control or power or something within the story. And I have to say I do deviate a bit, quite a bit, from the rules of play 
as it is in Dallas because not all of the attributes in, in this case in D&D or anything I'm doing are the same as they would be in D the Dallas role-playing game. And also in that game, it is not really specified what you are meant to use, say persuasion or coercion or investigation for per se, they're all interchangeable. But what I have decided to do is say that uh, persuasion is going to be what you are using uh, when you're trying to elicit some type of help or aid of somebody to attain a goal and coercion as opposed to coercion. So these are opposites in this case where you are encountering potentially an unfriendly NPC and trying to either get information from them, direction, or to stop them from thwarting you. Now, of course, this presumes that you know whether you're dealing with a friendly or an unfriendly enemy, and you're going to have to work that into your own adventure, or your own campaign as to whether or not that is actually the case, and if it isn't, how you would determine that. But um, in any case, that's how I am differentiating. And then investigation I am using in this case just for specific information, like a more of a quote-unquote factual piece of information as opposed to um, either help or the um, attempt to stop somebody from thwarting you. In terms of the values that um, I came up with here, these are translated from the Dallas Rules. The Dallas Rules, as mentioned, um, incorporate attributes that aren't necessarily going to be in other games, and in this case I'm translating them from D&D. &D. So for persuasion, the persuasion affect value in the Dallas Rules is calculated by totaling intelligence, which obviously does translate, something called charm, and something something called attractiveness. Now, in D&D, &D, we have charisma, so I'm just saying that charm and attractiveness are sort of the same and going to be charisma. There's also a resist value. So each of these values has two sides to it, the side of the character who is attempting it and then the side of the character who is resisting it. In the case of investigation, the values are the same, but in the case of persuasion and coercion, they differ. So as we can see here, the resistance, what you calculate your value resistance to your persuasion is a combination of your intelligence and strength. Now, this strength value in Dallas is actually something called nerve, which again does not translate into the system that I am using here, but I picked the closest one. Coercion is a combination of intelligence, strength, and in the case of Dallas, something called unscrupulousness. Here, I'm basing this on the alignment of the characters in D&D &D to contribute to that value. And obviously, the um, unlawful evil characters are going to have a higher number on this because we're talking about a coercive act. And the resistance to that is a combination of charisma and strength. In the case of the Dallas Rules, it's actually charm and nerve. And then finally, um, on intel, uh, excuse me, on investigation, we have the investigative value as being intelligence, charisma, and strength combined, and the resistance to that is also the same, intelligence, charisma, and strength on the target character. So these are the three different aspects and how the numbers, the values, are being um, attained. A second thing you need to do is to translate these values because in Dallas the um, the values of everything are on a scale of 1 to 9 and obviously that is not the case in D&D. &D. So I did a very basic conversion which uh, for the mathematically minded of you I realize may not be exactly accurate. I sort of toyed with two ways of doing it. What I ended up with is um, basically taking the values uh, that we could possibly get in D&D &D and assigning them starting at the top so that I translate all the stats that I have, and I'll show you how I did this, to a numeric value that works in the Dallas game so that when we do the actual rules of how we decide whether this has been effective or not, we're working within that system. So let me show you how that goes. Let's take a look at this in action and see what we get. So we've got Sir Charlie Nature Walker. He is a druid who is coming to the witch's home. This is Lady Felinius, and he wants to get some information from her. He needs her to come out of her little um, room here to 
give him something or whatever, and he decides that he is going to use persuasion to get this to happen as opposed to some other type of combat. So what, what this means is, and I've got the uh, values, this is their baseline values here, and this is how I've converted them in the yellow to fit this social combat system. And as a reminder, here's what will happen. He's going to take his intelligence and his charisma values times two, get a number. She's going to resist with her intelligence and strength and get a number. You take the differential of these two numbers and see what it is. If that differential is 12 or greater, it's an automatic success. If it is 1 or 2, it's an automatic failure. But if it is in between 2 and 12, it's going to be a 2d6 roll that you need to roll that number or less to have a success. So in this instance, it's let, left up to fate. So what we're looking for for him to be successful is the 2d6 roll of 6 or less, and he is unsuccessful in doing that. You can take the lack of success a little bit further if you want and look at how unsuccessful he was, of course, and you can do this using any other type of system that you have, or you could also apply the system from Dallas, which has a luck-based system where you can apply luck points to modify a role, and I'm not going to get into that now because it's already getting to be a little bit of a long video, but you could see here one way how persuasion may or may not work. Now let's say he tried something different. Let's say he tried instead of to be persuasive to her, which um, he wasn't going to be that successful in, let's say he decided to try to coerce her in some way. What would that look like? In this instance, you can see that his intelligence and strength and his alignment, which is a lawful good character, adds up to only 13, whereas her resistance to coercion, her charisma and strength, adds up to 12. The differential there of 1 means an automatic fail for him. So as a lawful good character, you can see that this type of approach to a social situation is not something that is going to be natural for him or necessarily very successful. But let's look at it from the other way around. Let's say that she is trying to coerce him. He's come barging in here, but as a response, she's trying to coerce him into leaving or giving her what she wants. She's got a much higher coercive value because she, her alignment is as a chaotic evil witch character is going to buff up that value. So the differential there is eight. So what this means is that she is going to have a success. She'll be rolling these two d6s She's going to have a success on eight or less. So let's see if she can get a success in coercing him. And indeed she did. She got an eight. So she was successful here. And even if she hadn't been successful, she may have had, if you were using a further table to determine degrees of success or failure, she may have had a closer chance, obviously, of getting a roll close to eight, even if she couldn't roll eight or less, which indeed she actually did. So she would be more successful in um, applying co a coercive social technique against him because of her alignment. So it works out in uh, theme with your character's development and personality. I want to conclude here by giving you a look at the actual rules so that you can have them in mind if you want to modify them for some set that you're using. I was using this persuasion affect value calculated by totaling intelligence, charm, and attractiveness. The resist value to persuasion is the total of intelligence and nerve. Coercion is the sum of intelligence, nerve, and unscrupulousness. And the resist value on coercion is the sum of charm and nerve. The seduction affect value, which I skipped over because I don't put that in my games, but there it is, is the sum of charm, unscrupulousness, and attractiveness. And the seduction resist value is intelligence and nerve. And finally, the investigation um, value is going to be the same for each character, and it will be the total of intelligence, charm, and nerve.
So this is how you could use the baseline calculations. Obviously, you're going to have to come up with a system for uh, modifying this to get to your system that you are using. And the values here come on the basis of 1 being a low number and 9 being a high number. In terms of actually what you do to determine the um, effectiveness of the attempt is as follows. What you do is you sum up the number of the um, affecting character and you can add in modifications and things like that if you so choose in terms of the circumstances or whatever. I wasn't showing any of that here because I was just trying to demonstrate how it worked. And then you substitute, uh, excuse me, you uh, subtract the value of the resist value of the target character. If the spread is 1 or less, the attempt simply can't succeed. If the spread is 12 or more, the attempt is automatically successful. You don't even have to roll the dice. And then if the spread is between 2 and 11, inclusive, you roll 2d6s. And if the dice roll is equal to or less than the spread, the effect attempt is successful. So there you have it. It's a look inside the, some of the um, social combat rules from the Dallas role-playing game by Jim Dunnigan, Game Design and Development, and Redmond Simonson, Graphics and Physical Systems. I think this is a way of adding some complexity to the what can end up being just a kind of yes-no question to your games. It does take a little bit of work because you will need to come up with the values and translate them to have them work, but if you do that once for the characters and the characters repeatedly interact with each other, you have the values and, um, and then you're ready to roll. If you also are using any type of success chart with the value of a great success or a minor success or a great failure or a minus or not too much of a failure, um, this will help add in further complexity to the answers that you get from the questions and how you progress in a storyline without resorting to any type of physical combat. Thanks for watching.